So, in continuing the techie uh, marathon here, and I'm sorry for you guys probably falling asleep, CPAP. I never liked CPAP, and I'll tell you why. <clears throat> the, the portable um, products, you could never tell what was going on with it. You just couldn't tell how, why it was working, or if it was working. So I got mad, and I go out to Mercury Medical where I look to help them design stuff, and just they rent my brain by the hour. And I sat down and said, look at this junk. We got all of them on the market. I want to test these on a bench model. None of them functioned like they should have. A lot of them didn't even come close. So I'm, I, it takes a lot to get me mad, but I don't like junk. And I, you know, if we don't get it right, it should never be... It should be the concept that we're stubbing our toes on, not the product that's supposed to fix it. You know, all you smart guys here can figure out a product that will work if we get the concept right. So I said to these guys, the design engineer, the rat man, and I went down to his lab in, in the corner of uh, nowhere and looked at these things, and I said, this is nuts. You know, we need a mass that goes on quickly, that goes on fast, that's comfortable, that is not going to cause nasal bridge necrosis, that we have a monitor, we have a pressure gauge sitting right there in the middle. This is what you're getting. And we got some remote areas in Florida, Polk and, and Hernando County, that it may take an hour and a half to get to the hospital. But if you've got a guy taking 15 liters a minute, you run out of oxygen. So the second phase we were going to make is let's make one to save some, some oxygen here, because you know, it's not Pinellas County where you got a two and a half minute response time. And you got to think about all these things. And you guys, if you can loan your brain to industry, you will make a difference. These guys want to put out better products. And no Me Too stuff. I never recommended or worked on a Me Too project. This had to be better. I was just tired of the junk. You ever see these guys in the tackle box with a metal disc to cut your fingers on and some crazy strap that nobody can find? And these guys are going down the road 60 miles an hour with a guy dying and they're fooling with the technology. No, it's got to be put on and ready to work. So I, I had some pretty tough criteria. As you can see, I'm a patient sort of guy. But I'll tell you what, um, and I'm not selling this mask. I can, it, it, it happens to solve most of the deficiencies, but there will be something else we'll think about that we'll have to add something to. The other thing is I wanted something you could put a treatment in, okay, like a, uh, some aerosol medicines uh, so that there was a, an option for that, and I wanted it filtered. So if we got, we got H1N1 influenza that can kill you, and we got these guys in a, in, a, in a blue box going 80 miles an hour, I don't want my compadres coming down with a preventable illness. And so those are tough criteria. And so we added all this stuff available, and some masks have it and some don't. But I want the whole enchilada because I don't want my buddies coming down with something we can prevent. That is the dumbest thing I can imagine, but it happens, believe me. Okay. So I'm a medical designer for Lincare. I'm actually the director of Mercury. I've been out there, like I said, three times in the last two years. <laughs> you know, I don't get paid for any of this stuff they're selling. And I'm not talking about any, uh, un, any FDA unapproved recommendations like I usually do. Okay. What's the, so what's the normal, the normal physiology here? <clears throat> so normally, when you and I inhale, we draw air into the lungs with negative pressure. Our buddy, the diaphragm, this big piston, this plunger, sucks air into the lungs. The pressure drops, airflow comes in, and blood comes with it. So we've got the abdomen that has this splanchnic bed with a lot of volume there. Anybody that's ever seen a belly gunshot wound knows how much they bleed. <laughs> oh, boy. Okay. And so what happens is as the diaphragm pulls air in, it raises abdominal pressure, increasing the flow gradient. So you've got a push-me-pull-you setup to get the blood flowing through the lungs. It's a great setup. And has anybody ever seen if you lose a diaphragm, you got a problem. And we saw that in open heart surgery when they were freezing the phrenic nerve all the time. They never seemed to get it through their heads. But they got it figured out. Now they made a protector. So anyway, when the diaphragm sucks air in, the pressure falls in the chest and rises in the abdomen. And this gives the venous blood flow a bigger gradient to return to the right heart. This is a thoracoabdominal pump. And you can prove what happens. When you, when you suck air into the lungs, at the same time you inhale, blood, the, the perfusion to the left ventricle drops. 
because now with this negative pressure and you're filling the blood pool in the lungs, there's less uh, essentially pulmonary artery, which is the vein that perfuses the, the heart. There's less blood flow going to the cavities of the heart. And if you put your hand up and feel your pulse, when you take a big inhale, you'll find that the volume gets skinny and when you exhale, you find it fattens up because as the lungs accordion lets the air and the blood out, it goes back to the filling of the left heart. So that's the normal pattern by which we breathe and it works quite well. So <clears throat> air's drawn into the lungs, you drop the pressure down in the chest, the venous blood pressure to the right side or the preload is definitely an enhanced and the expanding lung acts as a pump, pools returning blood in the venous the lung circulation and decreases left heart filling and you can feel your the volume in your pulse to prove that when you exhale you got this stretched lung with elastic recoil and it does the job for you even though work is done bi-directionally in the lung you really only have to pay for it one direction and that's when you get the air in and so uh, it's always nice to know that okay so the air spaces and alveoli are kept open <clears throat> by surfactant uh, when the lung contracts so that they don't, they don't uh, collapse on each other. And that's because the walls are negatively charged and it prevents total collapse of the alveoli when you got a near empty lung by exhalation. And so this, this synchrony between blood and, and flow, Mother Nature in her wisdom, <coughs> my, my lady uh, residents love that, you know. You gotta refer to Mother Nature as a, as a, a lady. And so <coughs> it really allows these things to, to get CO2 out and the oxygen in uh, simultaneously. What good does it do to oxygenate something there's not enough blood flow? So <clears throat> it's, a, it's a neat idea. So what about heart failure? Uh, you know this is a more common entity. We've heard all about it in various lectures. So most of the illnesses are not total heart failure. It involves the left heart. And the left heart as we know is a pressure pump. That's why you can see these huge pressures that get generated by the ventricle. We've all seen the aortic stenosis like a pinhole and the guy's still walking around to our amazement. So the left heart is a big thick muscle. It's great for pumping pressure, uh, but it's very thick. And so the right heart, however, is a very skinny ventricle. Why? Because it doesn't have to push high pressure. 25 over 5, you know, it's nothing. It, you know, it's one-sixth what the lung, uh, what the left heart does. And so, it, you know, it's, a, it's not going to be thick. It's going to be a good volume pump. It'll distend if you want it to, like a water balloon. But it's not going to be a good pressure pump. So because the, most of the illnesses are unilateral left uh, heart, when heart failure uh, occurs, the stroke volume, that's the number of cc's per beat, goes down to make up for the decrease in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the squeeze. So you've only got two ways to keep the pump up, the heart rate and stroke volume. And so um, that's why uh, we'd like to, uh, we'd like to uh, understand how this thing works. So that there's a lot of cardiac sympathetic tone in heart failure. And when that happens, it basically is measured by cardiac norepinephrine. You got an increase in oxygen demand because of that sympathetic tone and an increase in myocardial work, just what you don't want when you're in heart failure, you got a you got a, 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 a collapsing horse and you've loaded up the saddlebag, so that's not too good. So we know that the usual causes of left heart failure are cirrhosis, hypertension, and vascular disease of other stuff, and or cardiomyopathy. This accounts for about 18 percent of the cases of, of left heart failure, and alcohol and thyroid, viral and family are about it, unless you work in a cobalt factory. <clears throat> okay, so. Uh, you may remember that uh, the Toronto had Labatt's Ale had they put cobalt in the beer to make the foam come up like Lincoln's hat. Well, then so people started getting heart failure, and they said, "Oh, it's the cobalt." Nope, it was the volume of beer the Canadians were drinking. It didn't make a damn bit of difference. <laughs> Oops, <laughs> wrong for the wrong reason. <laughs> so <clears throat> a little history there. So uh, <clears throat> I, uh, um, Indiana wrote the first definitive uh, two series articles from in the annals on cardiomyopathic change. So uh, we were drummed into it. Anyway, so the left heart can't distend. The right heart continues to pump because it's a volume pump. And so because you've got a difference in cardiac output, right being normal, left being abnormal, that declination causes the lungs to be stiff and rigid, <clears throat> be hard to ventilate, 
the gas space goes down, water fills the air sacs, it simply pulls the surfactant off the uh, alveoli, and then gas transfer gets very much decreased and the oxygen levels fall. And you'll see people in pulmonary edema coughing up this stuff in that bedside stand we put on them, and the bubbles will be, if you go back an hour later, because they never get it cleaned up in time, you will still see the bubbles. And that's because surfactant is doing its job in the foam that comes out of uh, heart failure air, uh, airways. Okay, so the therapy and in, in the, how are we gonna fix the left heart? So anytime you've got a, a preload reduction, and that means that you're going to block down the blood getting to the heart. Um, that's going to help it. Okay. And then if you've got afterload reduction, that's the resistance to blood leaving the heart. That's going to help. And so what do we use? We use nitroglycerin, which is a peripheral vasodilator, and ACE inhibitors, which is also a peripheral vasodilator. And then we try to decrease cardiac sympathetic tone and, and autonomic uh, vasoconstriction and fluid retention. Aldactone is a biggie. And you know, even at Indiana in the 60s, we used aldactone in all of our people with heart failure because Eli Lilly was there and they did, they did the whole inventive work on renin angiotensin and we were well schooled in the fact that we needed to get rid of the sympathetic tone. And then beta blockers. And by the way, I had a seven year fight with everybody I work with that, uh, and they were all saying I was a non-compliant physician for not using all beta blockers in all MIs. And, you know, it took seven years for the American College of Cardiology to be honest and say, you know what, if you've got low EF in a heart failure, you better not use beta blockers. Why? It knocks the rate and it knocks the squeeze. So you can't compensate. So I, I finally won my argument, but they, they were, it was a little heated sometimes. And, you know, I never let people that are not as smart as the evidence think for me. If they're smarter than you, they can think for you. But you'll find out most of the guys that give you advice are not smarter than you. They've just got a different trend that they're looking at, okay? And we've all learned not to accept all the information we get. Thank God. Okay, so anyway, all those things will help. And that's really all we have for left heart failure. Half the low reduction, pre-low reduction, sympathetic lysis. And it, it's still the, 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 the hallmark here. Let's see what I got going so what does CPAP therapy do? It improves abnormal work of breathing by pressurizing air going in the airways. It corrects hypoxia. It decreases myocardial oxygen consumption. That's a biggie and that's proven by a decline in the cardiac norepinephrine that's circulating. It reduces preload. It decreases sympathetic toad and, uh, tone and it, uh, it reduces cardiac risk and decreases cardiac arrhythmia. Now, Every one of us as rookies would see a guy dyspneic and is, is this heart failure or lung failure? One of the ways you can tell is that if you give a little oxygen to a COPD or the PO2s come up dramatically, very dramatically. You can give gallons of oxygen to a guy in heart failure and it doesn't do poop. So if you just give them oxygen with an O2 sat and it comes up dramatically, it's not left ventricular failure. That's a very simple bedside trick, which you probably all knew anyway. I don't want to be redundant on your information. But what really happens is that you cannot, get a, you cannot give them enough oxygen without pressurizing it to get the PO2 up. So let's take a look at why would we want to even use CPAP. Um, and so what this is is continuous uh, positive airway pressure with a, with a mixture to the lungs through a sealed mass device with titratable flow. You get fast attainment of work reduction and cardiac stability decreased need for intubation and possible consequences, which means you tube in the wrong spot, tissue damage, cardiac arrhythmia, and dental damage, all of which are suitable illnesses, uh, it seems. And so we gotta be careful with what we do. Now, <clears throat> so it's a pressure, there used to be a, a pressure flow generator, but that's no longer necessary. We just plug it into the wall and we put them, put them on however many liters. And so they're now, excuse me here, now they're disposable and they don't require any pressure flow generator, only oxygen. And the, the, the pressure that we like to see, and this is hard to believe, that as little as two and a half to five centimeters of water pressure will fix the cardiac failure. This is a very, this is not, mer, this is not millimeters of mercury, this is centimeters of water. So I said, we gotta make a mass between two and a half and 12 and a half centimeters of water that's got a, something there that says, that's what I'm getting. I don't want somebody's promise. I want to see the numbers. 
and we put it so that you can, it's right there in your line of sight so you don't have to chase what you're doing. Now, head straps. We looked around. What mask comes off quicker than anything? I know Tom knows. He's an old baseball fan. Dr. Grinnell, uh, he, what's one? The catcher's mask. That's how we made it. You know, got this Velcro straps and this little headset, put it on, tighten it up, no, no pieces to find, no junk to look in the tackle box for. I just really got insulted. I went on, looked around what these guys were doing on some of their runs and went, oh my God, how do they do this? I wouldn't like it. So anyway, we put a pressure bar across the forehead so that you didn't hurt the nose, make it more comfortable. And so then we had a problem at Bayfront where they've got this big queue of ambulances all coming to want to get in, me too, me too. When they bring people in on heart failure, we got three CPAP machines. You know, the big old clunky things that sell for 30 grand. But nobody ever knows where they are. I was even going to put a microchip to monitor where the hell they were, but they're usually on some huge obese post-op patient that didn't bring his or her CPAP in. Guess what? So we never had anything, so they would back up and wait. Well, at 540 runs a day, that's screwing up the efficiency. No, no, no. All you do is take whatever the settings were, and you put that leader flow, plug the oxygen in, and it's back to the, back to the ball game. These guys were able to then get in and out of the hospital, and the hospital didn't have to waste personnel's time looking for what we didn't have anyway. It was a continuation of care and a monitor that shows you you're actually getting what you wanted. Okay, so it's, it just, you just hand it off to the ER and, and continue what was being done and, uh, while uh, they're evaluating them with EKGs and a few other things. So uh, it, it really, uh, as positive air is pushed in the lungs, it reduces inspiratory muscle work by actually helping do it. It decreases venous return, uh, which we want, uh, <clears throat> and it, it, uh, it blocks the... Uh, it blocks the afterload. So you get less pooling in the lungs, less fluid transferred into the air spaces, decreased cardiac sympathetic tone. The total sympathetic tone is still high. Uh, decreasing afterload and uh, cardiac heart rate resulting in lower cardiac work and oxygen consumption. And so that's all been studied. If you put a swan in, anybody with a pressure of 12 or more will definitely benefit from CPAP. If it's not, which anybody in pulmonary edema is going to have a wedge of 12 or more. So it, when do we use this stuff? If you can't keep the oxygen up at, uh, with 92% uh, with 4 liters, that's when you need to get out the mass. Respiratory distress increasing. Level of consciousness is starting to dip. Cardiac arrhythmia is not getting better with drugs. Respiratory acidosis increasing CO2. Cardiac rate 120 or 30 and not responding to oxygen therapy, and a respiratory rate of 36 and not responding to oxygen therapy, and that really means you didn't get the PO2 up to 92. Okay, so uh, goals of CPAP: get the O2 up. Number one, we're all uh, obligate air, uh, anaero aerobes rather. Decrease work of breathing and improve the patient's status. Cut the cardiac rate down, decrease respiratory rate, improve the CO2 if elevated. And by the way, we use capnia stats in all our, our ambulances. We got it right there. Um, uh, the arrhythmia should be getting better. <clears throat> you don't want to do infield intubations. The first 540 or 500 and some runs that we made them fill out cards, other than for people found down not breathing, there was not one intubation in the field. And there's many tubes that some of us have put in. How would you like to be 70 miles an hour bouncing around with a guy flouncing around trying to get that tube in? I don't know how the hell they do it. I have ultimate respect for those guys. But because of that, let's make it so they don't have to do it. Don't put our colleagues in jeopardy. This, thing's, this was part of jeopardy reduction here. <coughs> Mental status should be getting better. And then you leave the settings on. Uh, when the patient gets transferred. And we start off at 10 centimeters of pressure, and then if the guy's getting better, they get better immediately. You, you, you got to help them understand how this thing works because some people are very twitchy about having a mask on their face when they're having trouble breathing. So who can't use it? You got a fractured face, bad idea. Recent gastric surgery, <coughs> that means where you've actually made incisions in the stomach, not a lap band uh, event. Copious secretions are requiring therapy and suctioning. That's hardly ever it. Can't tolerate the mask, an, an arrest, PCO2 greater than 50 and heart failure. And what we really do there, that's, not, that's a relative. We monitor that because if we're doing it right, it goes down pretty quickly. You got ventricular tack or ventricular fib, forget about it. 
You know, you really, you got to have at least one of the parameters control. The level of consciousness is dipping. Persisting vomiting and pneumothorax. And in trauma, you'll see all those things. So those are the, hang on just a minute. Nasal bridge and necrosis doesn't happen anymore thanks to the, the forehead bar. Hypotension, and, and that's what happens when you put it on a guy that's got COPD because they're all dried out from not drinking and eating and breathing too quick. And all you do is start running in volume, and then you realize you didn't need the pressure there most of the time. Catastrophic <coughs> uh, claustrophobic. And coaching really helps. And we, we went to the paramedics and showed them how to coach people and, and start out easy. So my, my worry is this. You and I, with all our medical knowledge, sometimes have trouble telling whether it's heart or lungs. Because nobody ever told us we needed to, to know that nor showed us how to do that. But basically, what happens is, uh, if you've got COPD, I wanted to know from the literature what difference did it make. Well, because the, the blood gas abnormality in COPD is largely related to the work of breathing. Okay? And, and we know that from the hagen poiseuille equation, which has been pointed out before, talking about that pi, tie the, pi times the radius to the fourth power of the airway times P1 minus P2 is what gives you the flow that you're looking for. And <clears throat> so it turns out that when you do the work then, almost always the CO2 is lowered, <coughs> the SATs dramatically improved, level of consciousness improves as the carbon dioxide level falls, respiratory effort is enhanced and work is decreased, and CO2 production, because you're decreasing the work of breathing, you don't have to go through the Krebs cycle and produce all that carbon dioxide. So, in the ER, <clears throat> when it's COPD, bring them in and let them t taper uh, things down. If they want to intubate them, fine. But I'll tell you what, there was a very interesting study, it would be in Massachusetts, out of the New England Journal. I think it was April this year. I was stunned by what they did. They took people with COPD and they said, look, we think we could do CPAP ventilation and not have to intubate them because of all the reasons, infection being one of them. So they, they found that in COPD, they, they were able to handle without intubation 78% of the patients. And in fact, in, in Mechaland, the university, they only used it 35% of the time. And then the regular humans, which you and I would circulate in, being the, the outside real doctors that do this every day, 41%. They were using it more in the, in the non-research hospitals than in the hospitals. And they had a large number of people. So that's a trend that's going to change. We may see the need for intubation go down. Now, they were mainly using big machines to do that. But we all know that inspiratory work, if you can get rid of the inspiratory work, there's enough elastic recoil in the lung to get the expiratory work done without it. And once you calm people down, that's very doable. I, I was still stunned by those numbers. I have to believe it because they had some very hard data. But um, wow, I read every shred of that article. And I got to call the author yet, if that reminds me, and talk to him about what they've learned since that time. Because you know, most of that stuff's a year and a half old before they ever publish it. So anyway, um, <clears throat> One of the things you got to watch out for is hypotension when you're putting CPAP or any pressure limiting blood flow because they're dry. And so you just pour in the fluid and adjust the CPAP pressures downward. That's why you need a gauge. And uh, you know, I hope all the rest of them start putting gauges in their equipment because it's, it's, it's a big piece of what we need to be doing. So what about asthma? It again reduces inspiratory work. Asthma's got a special problem like COPD. We know that, that at least 90% of the work's done by the diaphragm. But what happens when you get an asthmatic attack? You know how big these lung volumes get. Well, here's your plunger with the diaphragm doing all the work trying to do it. But as you trap air, trap air, trap air, now there's no, there's no plunge. It's like if you're trying to clean out your john and you've got a, a little plunger that doesn't want to expand right, you're never going to clean it out. You've got to have some volume to get things flowing, whether it's water or whether it's air. So the flattening of the diaphragm is a disaster in both COPD exacerbations and in asthma because it absolutely causes muscle work. Diaphragm is a pretty efficient muscle. It doesn't use nearly as much energy as the accessory muscles when people are panicking. And so, uh, and, and again, in, in this study in, in uh, Massachusetts, 
I did not find any um, asthma evidence, but um, if they can take care of COPD with a, and I, and I don't want, know about you guys, but if you intubate an asthmatic, good luck. You will get a pneumothorax. The peak pressures required to do that are huge. And remember, some have overventilated alveoli and some have under, and boy, it's a nightmare. So I, in my experience so far, I think I've ventilated less than 10 asthmatics. But, I bet, but I've ventilated, I don't know how many thousand. COPD years, way many, but that's a trend that may that may um, that may not last. And I'm just showing you some examples of these masks here. Um, and I'm not selling the flow safe. It just seems to solve most of the problems. All of these things will work, but you got to know what pressures you're getting. And if I were making an edict, I'd tell all these companies, if I were the pure food and drug guys, put a pressure monitor on there so we know what we're getting. But anyway, this thing, um, <clears throat> the CPAP today is not what we had 20 years ago. And so our understanding is, is really better about it. And it, it, it really, the, the people, this thing works so well that the doctors in the ER would argue with the paramedics, the guy wasn't in heart failure until he got an upright film and went, <laughs> it's really full of water. It, that's how quickly it works. If they take it off, they get right back into poo again. So what they were doing is, is starting at 10. If they're really crummy, they go to 12 and a half, wait a little bit, go down to 10, sh show the patient how to use the mask, get them comfortable, let them fill their lungs. And after they get that first big breath, you don't have to coach them anymore. That's really great. And it allows the paramedic not to be looking around to assemble junk in a, in a tackle box. They, that's not their job. Their job is patient monitoring and delivery. And, you know, uh, I feel sorry for these guys. That's why I got so mad and started doing some of these things, loaning into my brain. So right now, a lot of places are using it in the critical care units. I can get a CPAP mask in my basic hospital quicker than I can get a shot of Lasix from the pharmacy at 11 o'clock at night. <laughs> it's the way it is. <laughs> sorry, but the system's slow. And so... <clears throat> Anyway, if they miss the diagnosis, it still it does not have grave consequences, and that's the whole thing. So, uh, we think about CPAP again. Think about the transport use of CPAP. Um, there are a number of places that did not use CPAP in transport. New York City still doesn't use it. And Chicago just recently started using it. It's been used in, in uh, big cities all over the country now as a more rapid form of getting the patient to the hospital because once you do that, the arrhythmias that you got to treat in route uh, fail to occur and you know, you don't die of a ventricular attack if you don't get ventricular attack. So <clears throat> it sounds like this would be so simple, but up until recently, the quality of the products are just sort of like, am I really getting this? I want to know the gauge. So. Um, you can use any mask you want as long as you're comfortable with it and it works. But I basically find that if you don't pressurize oxygen, you will never get the SATs up with just mask oxygen. And in COPD, uh, in, with heart failure, you can't give enough oxygen. And with COPD, you can't give as little enough oxygen, just a whisper. And that's one of the real tells for you until you get an x-ray and some other things back. So the technology is changing. Oh, by the way, what's the cost of these masks? Pretty much they all sell for 50 bucks. 50 bucks. And that's pretty good. Uh, so uh, since we're going to have them on oxygen anyway, you might as well use a CPAP mask of your choice, whatever that is. And there are five or six of the Bougenacs, one on the market. Uh, um, boy, there's, there's three or four masks that are currently being produced. But I think you're going to find that, that, that no matter who makes them, that monitoring of pressure and having the, the head strap that doesn't have to be assembled in route is going to be a real plus for expediency. Because you know, your life is on the line when you're in pulmonary edema. And it's got to be scary. I mean, have we ever seen a calm person in pulmonary edema, including the people taking care of them? I don't think so. <laughs> okay. So <clears throat> that's it in a nutshell. Uh, we've come a long way with the CPAP, and that's why this stuff works. And if you don't get it right and you've got COPD or asthma, it'll still reduce the work of breathing and the CO2 most of the time. And, to, and it'll keep them alive because, remember, people do not die of CO2 retention. They die of hypoxia. And as long as you can correct the hypoxia, you will get them to the hospital alive. We just had this myth that, that CO2 retention will kill you. It may slow your breathing down, but as long as you've got oxygen on board, don't take that mask off. You'll get them to the hospital. A PCO2 may be 130, but you've got them there alive. That's your job. 
And so I look at it differently, because I've done this for a few years, that um, the lessons of today are that anytime we can directly approach the physiology of a failing heart acutely, you're going to make a big difference in how, they, how quickly they get better. And um, the paramedics, uh, they're always a little reluctant, as like we heard from our lecture about change, that nobody wants to change too much. But once they saw how good this was and how, how easy it was to work with, they went, man, why haven't we been doing this before? And, and, and that, that's what you like to hear from their observation of how the patients did with it. That's what I care about. And that's why we sat down and interviewed Dan to don't blow smoke up in my fanny. Tell me, better than, better than before or worse than before? How much better than before? How much worse than before? And uh, we had them fill out cards about what was going on. And, and uh, the fire captain, Steve LaCroix, and I uh, reviewed all these cards. And I'll tell you what. It was amazing how, how simply making a product that delivers what you know you're getting makes a difference. We can actually measure it. So I'm not touting FlowSafe, that's just the one of them on the market, but think about CPAP again in transport because it pays big dividends. Even the ones that don't work as well as they should still are better than not having the oxygen come up to a PO2 of 92 or greater, okay? That's a fact. So whatever they've brokered for in your uh, paramedic transport, uh, tell them it's a good idea. And there's a whole bunch of references from this uh, information here. Okay. Question? Comment? Dr. Pell, that was excellent. That's, uh, you have an incredible command of the <laughs> cardiopulmonary system and the knowledge. I've done this for 40 together. years. Even a dummy like me can learn. That's what John Hickam said, you know. Then, damn it, if I can get you to think, you might amount to something. Well, I'm still thinking. I hope we all still are, yeah. huh? <laughs> so... <clears throat> I'd like to thank Southern Medical. It's strictly education. I love these guys uh, and the people that put this program together. It's a lot of work. They never get the accolades they deserve. And uh, keep on thinking and expanding. Remember, our job is to extrapolate solutions to the problems our professors could not based on better database and more information. That we are going to solve the problems that our predecessors could not and already have to a large degree. And, and it just takes one doc one nurse, one paramedic, one PA, one nurse practitioner with better ideas that work to change the way we all do business. One person can make a difference. So I hope it's all going to be you. All right? So thank you very much. And I got this device John, if, here if you if, want to come up. If you hold me. tight for just a minute, I got a couple of announcements. Oh, okay. And then you can come up and uh, take a look at that device there. Yeah.